Let's do this. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about the digital twin of the planet. We have Mark Johnson joining us. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really it's my appreciate pleasure. It. Super excited for this episode. We are just gonna be talking about one of, I think the most beautiful things, our beautiful planet that we all get to share and reside on and some of the most gorgeous imagery and analyzing it, so pumped for this. Mark Johnson, for those who don't know, is co-founder and CEO of Descartes Labs, which is a data refinery built to understand the planet. And you can find the links in the bio below, descartelabs.com, as well as the Twitter medium and also Mark's Twitter as well. Let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I mean, I think we're, I think things are getting better, right? Like you look at things like global poverty um, and it's plummeting, um, access to water, disease, right? Like just things are getting better from a macro level. And that makes me really happy because it wasn't clear when I was a kid that things were going in that direction. I still worried about global thermonuclear war when I was a little taught. And now we worry about that far less. So I think things are going in the right direction. We all have supercomputers in our pockets too. That's kind of neat. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the, the spiral upward is very, very powerful. And it's of, of the evolution of society. Well, I, like, so I lived through the PC, internet, mobile, right? Like that's a three massive revolutions that like I was on the front lines of. And I think all of those give me a lot of hope. Like I'll never forget the first thing that I accessed on the internet that I brought into a teacher in high school. I remember they're looking down at it, looking at me, looking down at it, looking at me saying, where did you get this? Uh, and now everybody has access to uh, free information. And uh, I think the effects of that on society could be decades down the road, but all positive. Yeah, yeah. The, the, what it, what is being, ha what is happening to the actual uh, minds of uh, youth that are being b born into our world with access to uh, querying the human uh, knowledge at their fingertips, moment, moment to moment, is doing some beautiful stuff. I want to um, let's hit let's hit on the journey. Um, born in Niagara Falls, who who were you when you were growing up, and how did you get interested in the fields that you got passionate about? I mean, I was I was a pretty nerdy kid, um, probably unsurprisingly. Um, I read a lot. Uh, my mother and I we used to go to the library with a stack of books on Saturday, and we would come out with another stack of books. So we just read, 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 and I think that helped a lot. Um, like I got really interested in volcanoes um, and really interested in um, not really archaeology but sort of ancient gods and belief systems when I was a kid. So um, I had all these really, really weird interests. Um, and I got a computer when I, we were from fairly humble means, but I got a computer also early on. And that was really neat, right? Because it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just a video gaming system, right? It was a system that you could actually manipulate. Um, and I'm, I was and I am a terrible programmer, um, but used to type in programs from magazines that would come in the mail. Um, and that teaches you a little bit about, like, about how the underlying thing works, right? It's not just this magic box that, that shows you pretty pictures. Um, there's actually a lot of mechanics that, that go into that. I think that really influenced me a lot too, so. Yep, yep. Um, those are big ones, those are big ones. And then what about uh, the transition into philosophy first at Stanford? Yeah, like I, well, I was a terrible student at first um, and I thought I was gonna be a math major uh, because I was, I was in this math program in Buffalo, it was pretty neat. Um, they pulled us out of math class starting in seventh grade and sent us to university. So I thought I was good at math until I got to Stanford and realized that like, <laughs> I was good at math in Buffalo, not so much in, in, at Stanford. Um, and then I thought computer science because it was 1997. It turns out I'm a terrible programmer. So I left for a few years, or for a year, um, about 18 months, and I spent time in PR. And this was during the internet boom. And it was absolutely crazy to like just watch companies, um, much like today, it's like you go from zero to getting bought by AOL in, in 12 months. Um, and when I came back, I thought, well, it doesn't really matter what I study, I'm just gonna go out and do something in technology anyway. 
And one of my first classes was a philosophy class, Mind, Matter, and Meaning. And I got a C minus on my first paper. And I was actually worked hard on that one. So I was really unhappy. So I went into the TA, and she explained why it was wrong. And I totally got hooked. Because philosophy forces you to ask questions mm. um, about things that people don't normally ask questions about. You know, uh, what is true? Uh, what is meaning? Um, how do people understand each other? Uh, and those are really, really tough questions, and I still don't have the answers to any of them, but it's fun to think about. Yeah, yeah. Every child um, would have an excellent, I think, experience having to um, go walk themselves through those types of questions. Um, that's, that's huge. Okay, and then, um, and then, so then there was a trajectory of like about like almost 15 years or so of time until Descartes really came up for you. And then what was kind of the moment for you where the moments for you that, that triggered your desire to want to work in this field? Well, I, um, I really like seeing technology come out into the real world. Uh, and the two startups before Descartes were both spin outs from labs. So PowerSet was a spin out of Xerox Park. So it was uh, natural language technology a decade before Siri and probably way too early. Um, and then my company before that, Zeit, was a spin out of University of British Columbia. Um, it took years before we could figure out how to use that technology and turn it into a product. So after, so I sold Zeit to CNN, ran it within CNN for a while. And when I left, my plan was actually, I was thinking like it'd be cool to just wander the halls of Carnegie Mellon and, and Stanford and Berkeley um, and see if I could find some really smart grad student PhDs who had some crazy technology and do something with it. Um, and I got a call from scientists at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and I'd read a biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer when I was in high school. Uh, and I was like, this is this whole project, the Manhattan Project, is the greatest science and engineering project of all time. I mean, it's just phenomenal the number of brilliant minds that worked on it, um, the fact that we were able to get it done. Um, you know, effects notwithstanding, it's just astonishing we were able to do that in such a short amount of time. So when I got a call from the scientist, I said, heck yeah, I'm going out to New Mexico. Um, and I didn't really have any expectations. And when I met them, I was blown away by how smart they were, blown away by some of the things that they showed me. And I, yes. I just took the leap. And I had no idea where it was going to end up. But um, I ended up in New Mexico. <laughs> Whoa! So it was, it was, so it was a big kind of like aha of like there are so many, there's so much data that needs to be refined from yeah. imaging the Earth. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these guys. So, like, what's amazing about a place like Los Alamos is that, in addition to being um, stewards of the national nuclear stockpile, there's a lot of blue sky research that goes on there. Um, and one of the things I think we all recognize as we were spinning out is that um, the way science is done is fundamentally changing. Mm -hmm. So we're moving from a world where we sample small populations and do statistical analysis on those small samples to a world where we continuously monitor things. I think the output of that is call it some kind of digital twin of the phenomenon, right? So um, like if you want to do uh, we want to do better drug testing. It would be really cool if you had some sort of simulation in a computer. You had some virtual humans to test on before yes. you actually tested in real humans. Yes. Um, in our case, building a digital twin of the planet, I certainly don't want to run A-B tests on the Earth. Um, totally. We might screw that up. Um, I would much rather run those in a simulation um, and understand these systems uh, digitally before we could go test them in the real world. So the recognition was if you want to do science like that, right, if you want to build these, these uh, complex models, it requires enormous, enormous amounts of data. Yes. Um, and even the data sets that we're looking at today on the petabyte scale, um, you expect that those data sets are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So what does that mean? So you've got these sensors that represent changes in the world, and you want to make predictions about the future. So you need some place to pull in all of this data. You need to access it really quickly. You need to be able to throw almost an infinite amount of compute against it. Um, and then you can start to build um, these digital twins. So I think that was like the core recognition at the beginning of the company um, and kind of you know how we started thinking about the world. And because of that aspect to your worldview, this is why I love you so much. You are pioneering what I think is that digital twin uh, phenomena that is about to just be way more 
uh, common in our world of viewing things that way. You gave the example of medicine. You'd much rather simulate what is actually going to happen when you take um, a pharmaceutical to a human's body before they actually take it. Um, there's so many examples of this um, in engineering simulation and healthcare simulation and um, planetary simulation, actually seeing what how a civilization evolves, how it's impacted by making uh, certain variable changes. Um, I love this. This is this is one of the best ways I think to to, to look at um, and just I don't like you're saying this it's is on the simulations all the way up and all the way down too, right? Like if you think about simulating a human body, like you probably want to simulate the cells, you want to simulate organs, you want to simulate the body. Oh, by the way, bodies are part of society, so you want to simulate how humans interact, right? Like I think that what's yeah. neat about this, if you really want to kind of take it to its fullest, is that. Um, you know, you get richer and richer models of how the world works and richer and richer models in silico rather than testing all this stuff out in the real world. So, um, I mean, yes. ultimately you just want to build these simulations. I mean, the reason that a lot of technology companies are good is because they do these A-B tests, because they test things against each other. Yes. Um, and it's just really hard to do that in the real world. There's, this world is finite. Um, whereas what we can do in a computer is infinite, especially if you can model it. And that's super exciting. Yes, and, and I'm excited to get to um, the technicals with you on exactly uh, how you're doing that. Let's let's get into some of the um, some of the craziness that we've been experiencing. Um, so this is the campfire. Yeah, probably a few hours after ignition. This is the campfire. I mean, this, how horrible is that? That's when it's small, um, relatively. So yeah, this is taken from space, um, satellite called Landsat 8, mm -hmm. uh, probably taken some hours after ignition. Um, and you know, what a horrible fire that was. 82 people died, something around that. Yeah. I believe were the numbers. Like, uh, I don't know, 250 square miles, something like that was destroyed. So I mean, it was just a, it was a horrible fire. Um, and we have to monitor this stuff better, yeah. right? Like we need to understand why these fires start um, we have to better understand what to do when they start. Um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to build is an automatic wildfire detector. So yes. Yes. Um, globally, you can go see a wildfire after it starts right away um, because the sooner you know about it, the sooner you can it's go take action. But yeah, it's, um, it's pretty scary. Right? And you can use thermal detection and optical detection. So there's, yeah, I think it was the, the, the previous slide had that, yeah, this was the thermal detection. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, obviously very grainy, but um, you can start to see, well, what do you mean by see here, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what we're seeing is sort of like an analysis, right? right? Really the, um, the thermal bands and um, seeing the actual like heat of the fire start. Um, whereas the other picture is an actual picture of kind of like how we think about it. Yeah, but I mean, that's what's one. exciting about this is that you can start to use these different types of data, combine them together. You just get this much, much richer picture of what, what's happening down there. Yes. And so this is even, we're going to be going through so many of these examples. They all tie in as a continuous record of the earth of monitoring the earth, and you said the scientific paradigm transition of instead of doing these small little case studies on people is now like having the sensors and the internet of things and the constant data stream that needs to be refined and have predictable uh, insights about the future. I'd let transitions massive. Yeah, I mean, actually when I was a kid, I used to play this game called Sim Earth. So there's Sim City, of course, <laughs> but there was another game called Sim Earth. Um, the goal is to like grow from single cell, well, from plants to single cell creatures to ultimately get some sort of sentient life and then you win um, and it was fun we started the company I really I, I thought about that a lot and like we kind of want to make a sim earth uh, and what's neat is that we've been collecting data about the planet from satellites that's publicly available since 1972 so that was pretty smart that we started doing that so yeah there's this uh, Landsat 8 uh, yeah so Landsat 1 went up in 1972 and was this is this one no, I think is this? this is probably eight. This is okay. Okay. Um, one went up in 1972. Yep. Okay. So there's been seven that functioned. One didn't quite work. Okay. Uh, but that means we have a continuous record back through that set of satellites. And these are U.S. taxpayer dollars through NASA. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and also, a really important event happened um, 
a little over a decade ago where we made those images free. So uh, that's been great because it means that uh, the Landsat Archive is free, a number of the other NASA satellites is freely available, um, and then the European a Space Agency, as they started putting up Earth observation satellites, also have made their data free. Uh, and this is great, right, because this is a public good. Um, which one is this? Uh, oh, that is a Sentinel. That's Sentinel, that's Sentinel-1. Um, okay, yep. So that's and a, that's the ESA? Yeah, so this is a European Space Agency satellite. What's neat about this, um, uh, there's two of them, uh, and they're radar satellites. So mm -hmm. um, Landsat is you know, mostly optical where it's like a camera. The light bounces off and it gets picked up by the sensor. This is an active sensor, so it's like a bat. It shoots out a beam of radar, it bounces off of stuff, and then it's picked up by the satellite, which is already pretty neat. Um, and it means it sees in a different kind of way. So one of the things that you look for is how much of the signal comes back to the satellite. So um, if you hit water, a ton of the signal is reflected back because it's highly reflective. Um, if you hit a forest where there's deciduous trees full of leaves, then a lot of that scatters. So not nearly as mm. much of the signal goes back. Mm -hmm. um, so what you can do with these satellites is kind of see, they're really good at seeing changes. So for example, um, if you have a bunch of trees, and then you don't have a bunch of trees, you can sort of see that change um, with the satellite. So um, it's this whole new modality. Oh, another neat thing about it is that the radar, um, the wavelengths are long enough that they pass through clouds. Yes. So in really cloudy areas, um, you don't have to worry about the clouds as much. And we find often combining the optical, where you actually see what's going on with the radar, where you sort of see in a different way, um, again, creates this much, much richer picture. This is a common theme when um, you're thinking about data and doing science on data, is there's no one data source that solves all of your problems. Oftentimes you need to combine a bunch of different data sources in order to get um, that sort of scientific picture. Yes, yes. Man, stacking optical, stacking radar. You can, now you can really start realizing why this is taking like petabytes of data and I mean we'll well I mean you, you know. go all the way from the sky to the ground too I mean think of like um, you know a plane flying over the Atlantic is throwing off hundreds of terabytes of data like cars would throw off a lot of data like you know we've got sensors on our wrists like everything is being outfitted with a sensor now um, and that means that you have all this data about things moving around um, you have pictures being taken from space you have drones and aerial flying so <laughs> more and more just the world is getting outfitted with these sensors, which means that basically we'll have um, the data to create a complete picture of everything that's happening on the planet. Um, and it's funny, I don't see that as creepy. I see that as more, um, I see it from a very scientific viewpoint, right? That this is important to do because we want to be good stewards of the planet. Um, well, I guess there's a creepy aspect to it also. Yeah, whoever's in charge of this advanced technology. That gets, a, that gets a perfect sensor viewpoint of everything that's happening on the planet at the same time. Yeah. Which, well, but it also makes us better stewards. If you, like, we're going to have a lot of examples in here that, um, that are going to further push that along. I really like how you explain that, um, that SAR uh, synthetic aperture radar yes. is uh, able to uh, penetrate clouds because half of the planet has clouds at it at any time. Which I thought at was, least. <laughs> that, was interesting. that was an interesting stat. Um, you can see damage after hurricanes easier. Um, okay, and then these, are these the geostationary ones? Uh, one of them is. Um, <laughs> these thought, are hard to, they're very hard yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, they're all sort of covered in foil, it looks like. Um, no, so there's another satellite. This is neat. Um, we're using it for, um, this is good at a lot of different things, but uh, wildfires. Um, it's called GOES. So there's been a whole series of these also. So these are meteorological satellites. So like when you see a hurricane like twirling in the Atlantic, yes. um, it's this satellite. But what's neat about it is it's geostationary. So yes. the other two are what they call push brooms. So they're kind of constantly going around the planet, taking pictures, taking pictures, taking pictures. So as the planet rotates, ultimately you get a full picture of the planet during some time period. Um, I think the Landsat satellites are each 16 days, um, for example. 16 day orbital period? They, they, you get a complete picture of the globe oh, every 16 days. There's two oh, of them. Oh, so it's still 90 minute orbital-ish? 
Uh, I think that's what the ISS is. Something. Well, yeah, but so these are these are just basically they fly. They're, they're flying over the planet as and and they're taking pictures constantly. Yes. And then you get a strip, and then it goes around. You get another strip, and you get another strip, and ultimately, once you get all those strips, you after you 16 get a things. you get a okay. complete picture of the planet. This just sort of sits up there and just takes a picture every five minutes. Now the resolution isn't great, right? Like you're not like getting- it's Geostationary. Geostationary. Okay. Um, and you're not getting uh, really high resolution. So like sometimes the, the pixels are like a kilometer squared, right? But what you do get is a complete picture of the continental United States every five minutes. And that's really useful if you want to do something like wildfires um, and you want to detect them in real time, you can't wait for a week until the satellite passes. It's too late. You need something that's constantly taking pictures. Um, so what we do is we pull the images off of the satellite, um, and they're ready in the system to be analyzed in about four minutes. So you have to like, you know, do some fancy footwork to make sure that um, the data is available and ready. Okay, so you're getting data sources from uh, landsats that are uh, in orbit every 16 days that are taking full images of the earth uh, and that includes the side of the earth that's dark versus the side of the earth that's light so you see some of uh, light pollution maybe you're doing things like closing the aperture a bit when you're on the dark side like how how yeah how is that working for optical imaging when you're well so there's there's a nightlight satellite so you can see night lights night also light satellites yeah okay um veers uh but okay. but but all of this is the sun reflecting off the planet. Uh, yes. So um, it's it's best if the sun is actually shining. Uh, but yes. what's neat about this is that we have so many different sources of data to draw upon. So you have you know satellites that are imaging the continental United States every five minutes. Um, you have MODIS, which is two uh, satellites, Aqua and Terra, that they image the entire globe every day. Again, not a great resolution, but you still get this continuous monitoring. You have Landsat, which uh, you know effectively is say say biweekly. Um, you have the Sentinels, uh, which they have several different series from European Space Agency doing radar are doing optical, doing daily. So you've got all these data sets. So we pull in somewhere on the order of like 10 to 15 terabytes of new data a day. Uh, we have about 15 petabytes of data in the archive. And again, a lot of this is publicly nice. available. This was, I, this was actually a big shocker when we started the company because I really didn't know about satellites, so I started studying them. And it turns out we have these massive records of data, and yet people can't answer basic questions about the planet. How much food is growing on the planet? How much food is growing in Brazil? How many trees have we cut down on, in the Amazon to the tree? Um, and mm. the fact that we couldn't answer these questions even though we had the data uh, made me scratch my head a little bit. Um, and again, this is sort of the foundation of the company is we ought to be able to answer those basic questions about the planet. Yes, yes. Okay, so you're getting the, the constant uh, stream of, of images of the planet of both uh, um, the f from both uh, satellites that are orbiting satellites that are geostationary, optical, radar, and then you have to do things like uh, come up with these insights. You have to re refine the data, come up with these insights, make them valuable to people that the, the people want to know about these that of the about these insights. Well, one thing you want to do is make sure that you just have access to all this imagery, right? If you think about it. Um, if you want to do a big analysis through time, it means that you, let's, the Corn Belt in the US is 3 million square kilometers. So if you want to know how much food is growing in this Corn Belt, um, and you want to monitor it while the food is growing, it means you look, need to look at those 3 million square kilometers every single day while the growing season is happening. Um, that's a lot of data. So partly what the system does is, um, the data refinery does is pull in all the data, um, clean it up, but then you have to make it accessible to people. So you need a, a really fast API that could go pull all those images out, stitch them all together, do some analysis on it, and then just keep doing that. And that's why, that's why you need to build a supercomputer in the cloud, because it's a, it's a, it's a tough task. You had an interesting story with the corn as well, where you were uh, get, you were getting the insights that uh, like every like four days compared to the USDA, which was only giving like corn insights around the planet every month. And then you kind of decided that you wanted to be a data refinery company um, uh, and kind of per potentially be doing this more for uh, all different types of, of uh, data interest rather than siloing yourself into like 
Uh, Corn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's being like silo on all the yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's cordy. I love that. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, no. So I think what's interesting when you go back and look at the early days of the company is like you're always putting the lens of how you think about the world today. So honestly, it wasn't. All, all this was not as obvious to us at the time. Um, but looking back on it, it kind of was. So we did the exact wrong thing that you're not supposed to do. We started off with the technology and figured out the market. They tell you in startup land not to do that, right? Like figure out the market, figure out the problem, and then apply technology to that problem. Totally not how we did it. Um, so we decided that we wanted to understand the planet. We said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, so the first thing we decided to do was agriculture. Um, and one of the reasons is just it fits the data set. So cornfields are big. Corn grows relatively slowly. And corn doesn't wander around. So like you can keep observing those fields every day. So the data sets are really well mapped. And then this goes and maps back to my assertion about how science is changing. So the way the USDA, um, during the growing season, understands or tries to forecast how much corn is coming out of the ground in billions of, of bushels of corn is they go talk to farmers. They go to fields. They go count kernels of corn. So they sample a small set of data. And then they have a bunch of statisticians who sit in a room for 10 days. Then on the 12th of the month, they, they announce what they've done. They're like, why do that when you can look at every cornfield every day? As long as there's not a cloud there, I can look at the field. Uh, so that's what we did. So in the first nine months of the company, um, we built this corn production forecast for the US. It was very accurate. Um, you can see the corn changing every day. Um, you can zoom in to, to the county level. Um, and when we, released the, <laughs> when we released the number on Bloomberg, we moved the price of corn 3% that day. Yeah. Um, and this was like a shock to people um, who follow corn in the Midwest because we weren't agronomists. This was a bunch of physicists who didn't have any special knowledge of corn. We just treated the corn like little factories and were able to understand what their output was and get a really accurate model. And that same thing is being done for soybeans, for we're gonna talk about like deforestation, we're gonna talk about actually counting the trees uh, around the planet, we're gonna talk about all of these different ways of um, monitoring uh, the exact like uh, yields of crops, how much food's growing on the planet, all these types of really important questions. Um, okay, so you guys are in Santa Fe, your team's grown quite a bit now. Um, we talked about some of this stuff. Um, the data refinery side of things, this is a really applicable um, explanation of how um, like an engine that we're really familiar with is your like Facebook engine or your Google engine where you're actually, uh, the data that uh, is being refined about your uh, search queries and then, then it's tailoring to you. Same thing with your news feeds, your videos on Netflix, your purchases on Amazon. I think that's a good way to get kind of like data refining over time towards personalized habits. Yeah, I mean, like all these companies like the Amazons and the Facebooks, like Amazon takes huge amounts of purchase data and they predict what you want to buy. Google predicts what you wanted to search for. Facebook predicts what you want to read. And they can do this because they have all this data, not just about you, but these external data sets like products and, and web pages and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I, I've kind of recast the world as a data refinery. I like that a lot. Uh, that's a you, I think you're the first one that uh, introduced me to the term data refinery, and I like that a lot. Refining well, the data. It's like an observation. Like um, I worked for a bunch of unsuccessful search companies, right? I didn't work for Google, um, and I had all these theories at the time, like why Google was better. Um, and there's a few reasons. One is that their data set was just better. Uh, they have a much cleaner, better data set. They, so they spent a lot of time in things like spam. Um, another reason is that they had a better laboratory for their scientists. It's not just that their scientists were more clever, it's that they could try more at bats, right? They can go experiment in real time. They can go push an algorithm live um, and see what the effects are. They were just really good at measuring it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, that's kind of the inspiration for the company is how do you create that laboratory for scientists to go try a lot of things. Uh, when we were built the original corn model, we tried over a thousand candidate models. Um, so that's a lot of data that you need to push through those models to test uh, how good they are. So, yeah, the the it's it's like when you have a a um, a like 
Like you give this example of when you were in the process of working at search companies and you could see that another company was doing things. This is kind of like what's potentially going to happen with like digital twins as well. Who can make the most effective simulations of a digital twin of the planet? Because you're not going to want to uh, A-B test on the planet that is uh, not as well simulated as the other organization that has a better simulation of the planet. So that's like it's kind of potentially going to lead into some dynamic, like maybe some oligopoly dy style dynamics where the ones that have the best simulations are going to get all the business, kind of like the Google and Baidu's are getting all of the business. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, one of the downsides of data refinery as a model is it's really hard to break it. So uh, look at Bing, right? We had really good scientists. We were building a decent laboratory to go kind of build better ranking engines. What we didn't have was a decade of user data. So there's this data flywheel that starts to happen where um, Facebook knows what you want to read because they know what you've read in the past and they have this huge population of people who have read things. So now they know what content to put in front of you that has the highest chance of you interacting with it, which means it's really hard for someone to break into that market. Um, and I think this is one of the hallmarks of, of data-driven companies is that um, if they get really good at that feedback loop, it's really hard to break it. And then there's, there's other effects too, like look at Netflix, where they realize that not only were they a good recommendation engine to recommend someone else's content, turns out they could build a whole new business on top of it because they knew so well what you watched they could go build shows based on your viewing preferences yeah. rather than your demographics or rather than your psychographics. Um, and that was kind of a mind-blowing leap, I think, um, in content production. Yes. And reminds these companies that they're not just search engines or social networks. Um, there's probably other businesses they could build on top of it. Yep. It could be good, could be scary. Yeah, yeah. The building businesses on top of the data that they're refining because they get the really valuable insights. and. It'll be interesting to see where the dynamics move. Um, okay, let's hit, um, the team's up to like 100 uh, people now. That's massive, congratulations. The team's growing super fast. I know, as a kid, I always wanted to have a lab of scientists, and now there's a whole lab of scientists Science. in New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were gonna be underground, but we're actually in an office. Oh man, this is cool. Yeah, I love this one. Okay, so this is NO2. Yep. Okay. So this is a new satellite that went up uh, from the European Space Agency. Um, and what it does is it monitors greenhouse gases. So it's sort of the first, or almost like prototype satellite. Um, and what this is, this is not a visual view of the world. What this is monitoring is um, NO2, um, and that's largely burning things. Um, so uh, it doesn't stay around for very long, but it's very visible. So um, as the globe turns, you'll be able to see some really neat stuff here. Um, so you th see things like shipping, obviously cities and human activity um, mm -hmm. as a big contributor. Um, but fires are also a contributor. Um, you start to see shipping lanes um, and you see sort of where the planes are flying. Um, okay. the, the bush in Africa, there's a lot of fires down there. You see the shipping lane from the Mediterranean down here, down yep. by India, goes down here, all the way that up to China. That is the shipping lane, yeah. yeah. Right through the South China Sea around the Indian Ocean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's this eerie picture of the world. You start to see human activity, well, both human and natural activity from this different perspective, right? Again, we're not yes. seeing the visual here. We're seeing this invisible gas that is in, in, indicative of different kinds of um, of activity. And you have teammates that are working on the different uh, ways of seeing the world through these different uh, activity indicators, through these different sensing systems and coming up with insights about that. Well, and this is interesting, right? Because this isn't just concentrations in the atmosphere. This is kind of like locationally, where is it, right? And there's not, there hasn't been really a global sensor that's been good at this so far. Um, and this allows us to go monitor greenhouse gases um, be able to pinpoint sources, for example. Um, there is. Does this separate? Um, there's, so there's a one that will measure like methane yeah, and one that. Yeah, let's keep let's going. Let's go to methane. Um, this is great. So this is a methane map. So methane is a fascinating gas. Um, CH4. Uh, it is odorless, colorless, um, and we've learned a lot about it over the past decade. So originally we thought it was about 20 times worse than carbon dioxide. Now that, that number keeps getting revised up, now it's a, they think it's about 35 times worse than carbon dioxide. So that's, that's bad, right? So we should try to reduce methane emissions. The problem is that we don't really understand the life cycle. 
you know, if there's cows, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> there's also um, places like um, where there's a lot of fracking. Um, so the natural gas is sometimes vented, so you see a lot of methane there. But you also see something curious, like why is there so much methane in the Sahara where there's basically nothing? Mm -hmm. um, and the current reigning, we don't really know, to be clear. Yeah. Um, the current reigning theory there is that um, the atmospheric conditions cause the methane to absorb more energy um, in those areas. But, you know, these are things that we really need to understand better if we're gonna make sure that we don't heat up the planet and, um, you know, screw ourselves. <laughs> the fact that you get an, a, a visual, like, again, this is a piece of data that it's not like when you're a hunter-gatherer on the surface that you can be like, oh, why is there a vast amount of methane that's coming out of the Sahara? Like, it literally requires you to get this image from satellite imagery, and then, then you can pose these questions and make these unique insights about, about the planet. Yeah. yeah, there's, I, well, and maybe you even, um, this is actually just night lights, uh, but you can see the flaring in the Permian Basin. So you have a few options with natural gas um, uh, that, that comes out of a well. So your choices are um, you just let it go, in which case it just goes up in the atmosphere. You burn it, which actually is probably better than just venting it, um, mainly because uh, the process, what, what comes out of burning is not nearly as bad as the methane. Um, the third, of course, is to capture it and use it, right? So we can use this natural gas. Um, but one thing you might wanna do in these areas where, so this is New Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a little part of the Permian Basin. One thing you might wanna do is, is fly aerial over these, um, these areas where there's yeah. a lot of methane. So you can yeah. go pinpoint sources. Oh, another source is leaks, just straight up leaks in the pipes. So. Um, as we get more of this data, it just means we can be better stewards and uh, understand the effect that we're having. And so um, we have NO2, we have methane, um, and this is, uh, this is China. Yeah. And what is, what's happening here? So we're trying to pinpoint, like, so what you want to do with this ultimately is you want to pinpoint sources, right? So um, there's sort of like global scale analysis you can do, of course. Uh, but one thing you might want to do is go pinpoint sources of pollution. Oh, the um, pollution. So is this CO2? What is this? Uh, I don't, this, I don't remember exactly okay. what this okay. one was. Pinpoint source of pollution. But you want to pinpoint source of pollution, yeah. So okay. again, this is not as granular as you probably want um, if you wanted to go pinpoint point every factory on the planet or every industrial plant on the planet. Um, but again, this is, if you think about a uh, policy that comes out um, about reducing carbon emissions or um, reducing greenhouse gases, one of the things you need to do is figure out where it's coming from. Um, so you can go, go police those regulations. So I think satellites like this are going to become critical uh, as, we, um, as, we <laughs> as we try to get everybody to be more sustainable. Yeah, where are the biggest uh, pollution um, sources across the planet. Um, yeah, the Amazonian deforestation on atmospheric chemistry, also the phytoplankton's um, uh, effect on uh, uh, the atmospheric chemistry as well, because it's what oxygenates our planet. It's so important to, to really slow down and think about the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and, yeah, and our planetary health. Yeah, I mean, again, I. There's so much we know now, and we should use that information to make smart decisions for the future, but we need to be honest with ourselves that there is so much we don't know. Um, and it's important to be honest with yourselves because it means that um, you direct science in a certain way, um, and very importantly, I think you direct what data you collect in a certain way um, to make sure you can start to build these models, right? Again, you wanna simulate um, what's going on in the atmosphere so we don't, <laughs> don't mess it up too much. Yeah. So like this is where uh, forests are really important, right? And understanding where, where there are forests and uh, where we've deforested is, is critically important. So this is where, if you go a few more. Oh yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is in Borneo um, over a few years. And these are all the pictures taken. As you can see. Um, you only got a couple clear shots. Yeah, you can yeah. sort of see what you ought to be seeing here in yeah. a few of those, yeah, yeah. but like, you don't see that very often, right? So you need a better way of, um, like especially in these cloudy areas, oftentimes where there's rainforests, these critically in endangered forests, um, you wanna be able to see through the clouds. Because you're doing the deforestation detection. Yep. And that's um, with synthetic aperture radar with SAR again. And, and it's like with Borneo, it's because of palm trees being cut down for palm oil. 
yeah, there's defore deforestation in Laos for rubber. Yeah, these, these types of... Yeah, you know, palm oil, rubber in Brazil, often soy. Um, soy yeah. So, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why, um, why trees get cut down. Mm -hmm. If you go to the next one, it's neat because what you can do is you can oh, yeah. see it, you can verify an optical. You can sort of see what's happening. Um, again, this is like we kind of translate the radar into something visual that you can see. Damn. And it kind of pops out. And what you want to do is once you've seen this, uh, see that change happen um, in radar, you want to go verify it when you finally get a cloud-free shot um, in the optical band so you can actually see it. That's what deforestation looks like. And so you can, there could literally be a cloud over the one on the right and you'd still get that image, which is cool. Because yep. then, it, yeah, you'd slowly be seeing potentially some of the, oh, uh, then there's a processing where you see like, uh, has the left side jutted out an extra couple uh, centimeters or whatever and then on the image and then you could know that, oh, potentially more trees are being cut down over time. And, and, and this is really important. Like if you think about cities, um, like we're awash in data, right? Like everything from people posting social media to, you know, um, cameras on, um, on lights, on, on traffic lights, um, just like people throwing off data, cars throwing off data. A lot of the places where natural resources are produced are places where there are just not a lot of people. Um, Western Australia produces an enormous amount of iron ore. There's literally almost no one in Western Australia. Um, if you look at the Corn Belt, Shout right? Shout out Perth. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, this is like Northwestern Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's Perth, yes. Um, but really, there's not a lot there. Uh, you look at places where um, food is grown, um, you look at places where oil is pumped out of the ground, like these are places where there's just not a lot of human beings. So one of the neat yeah. things about satellites is they don't care where there's humans, they're always just taking pictures. Um, so we can start to monitor these places of the earth and start getting data on places of the earth where there just isn't a lot of human activity or yeah, yes, yes. human data perhaps. Yes, yes. And the scales of this is very interesting too because this image um, you're, we're talking like that centimeter I was talking about on the image is actually, what is that, like a kilometer or it's like we're talking like... No, this is so um, maybe say uh, 10 to 15 meters per pixel here. So somewhere between 10 and 30 meters 10 per pixel. 50 meters per pixel. Per pixel. Yeah, yeah. that's a that's okay. Pretty, that's yeah. yeah, so yeah I, that's pretty <laughs> intense. Yeah, yeah. Look at you're not yeah. going to be able to see like individual cars, right? You're not okay. going to be able to see okay. certainly human beings. Uh, but again, you're kind of looking for these phenomena on the planet, which are are much larger in scale. It turns out natural resources, so agriculture, um, energy, m like metals, all these things are really large, and you can actually see at this scale. So yeah, like this is. And you'll change it in Indonesia between yep. 2017 and 2018. Start to see some of um, these farms pop up. Um, yeah. Wow. And it also makes me like feel Earth when I see this happening. Because the Earth has an ecosystem that is intertwined. And when that, is, that directly affects the insects, the animals, the plants, the, the soil compositions, the the uh, air cycle i mean it affects everything it's so it's like you can literally feel the earth change when we <laughs> deforest it yeah no it's really um i think it's really powerful for people at the company right as you're like as you're working on a project whether it's for a company a client or whether you're doing it you know we have a program internally called impact science where people kind of work on their passion projects um, but you can't help but like feel connected back to the planet uh, when you're doing this and, and thinking about all the changes that we're making. Like on one hand, it's really important that we need to sustain society, right? Like we've got billions of people to feed, they want stuff, like we need to make sure the society is moving forward. On the other hand, you need to do so in the most responsible way. Um, and the only way you start to answer these questions is by building up the data to create these highly interconnected systems. Like you hit on it, like this is not just about forests disappearing and okay, they're not sucking up as much carbon dioxide. Um, there's whole ecosystems that are on the ground here that we don't fully understand. We've got to start understanding how those things all plug in together. 
And what are the um, economic uh, uh, incentives of people in the regions that are making the decisions of doing these types of things? Is there a way to, um, to have offsets where you can um, incentivize people to not do, uh, behave this way, but rather to um, have other means of getting themselves into higher socioeconomic statuses, that type of stuff? Yeah, I mean, monitoring and tracking are absolutely critical, right? So let's say most companies don't want to source soy from former rainforest, but how do you go verify that? Um, in some ways, you need both a monitoring system, something like satellites, and uh, really you need some sort of tracking system um, uh, like blockchain or something like that where you can track uh, how, how these products and goods move through the system. Um, so you can go back and verify, like, what if you wanted to do um, something like, so no-till field. So um, the ground pulls in an enormous amount of carbon dioxide, and it traps the carbon dioxide in the soil, which is great. Um, if you go till the field, if you go plow it up, a lot of that carbon dioxide gets released. Um, so no-till means that it's sort of like a minimal tilling process where um, you leave a lot of the carbon dioxide in the ground. Um, what if you wanted to go verify that all of the corn that you sourced that fed the chickens, um, so you can say that your chickens are no-till? That's really hard right now because you need to go verify back in the yeah. system. So I think that some of the technology that's coming online is going to allow consumers to make better, more environmentally friendly choices. Um, it's going to give companies sort of something they, they, can, they can brag about, how they're um, how their chicken is more environmentally friendly, uh, but it really requires a lot of technology in, in that whole process to, um, to both verify and track. You can take directly the data that you're taking from satellite uh, imaging and immediately uh, put that on a decentralized digital ledger that's immutable and then you can verify if someone's actually um, following through on the indicators that they're claiming that they're following through on, these types of things. Love that. Um, Okay, so I want to hit on, um, there are also things like the fish farms in Ecuador that can be uh, monitored over time because fish farming, um, big one. I want to, um, uh, okay, so this is investigation into further um, deforestation, leveraging multiple data sources. There's um, uh, also, the, so not only is it global uh, a watch of deforestation. It's also um, the early uh, warning system for fire detection as well. Yeah. That's huge. We had that image at the very beginning of the campfire. We spent a lot of time thinking about trees. Um, and so actually this is a great picture. This is actually our team running um, up on one of the highest peaks in New Mexico. And they start, they're like, what's that cloud over there? It turns out it was a, a fire. So um, where we live in New Mexico is the southern tip of the Rockies, fairly high. Uh, so Santa Fe is at 7,000 feet, and then there's a bunch of you know, 10, 11, 12,000 foot mountains there. Um, and it was a really, really, really dry year last year. Like up in, there was almost no snowpack um, in our mountains. Um, by June, there was almost no rain. So we were terrified, right, like that, that we were going to have a terrible fire season. Luckily, the rain started uh, pretty heavily, uh, and we ended up with very few fires in New Mexico. But this inspired us, like, hey, we've got all this data. Um, can we do something? Can we, can we build an early warning system? Uh, so basically, what, what we tried to do is use the data from um, this GOES satellite that takes pictures every five minutes to see if we can go detect forest fires before um, they were detected in other ways. Because there's all sorts of ways you can go detect forest fires. So yeah. um, it's pretty neat. Oh, those are the disks. Um, so here. Um, like this is still early, right? Because you don't want to cry wolf too much. Yeah. Um, that's no good. Um, but uh, we continue to tune it. So this is New Mexico and a little bit of Texas. And um, the yellows are, are places that we detected um, uh, after it was reported. Um, the greens are actually places where we detected it before, before it was reported, reported yeah. um, which is really neat. So um, again, the early days of this, but this should give us hope, right? Because ev literally every minute counts with, yes. with forest fires. Um, and the difference between a major fire um, and a minor fire could be uh, those minutes. So the quicker we can get this in the hands of the authorities, the better. Lives saved, property saved. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind of and then you think about some of the other implications, like um, can we better understand fires themselves, right? Like, 
why do they start? How do they yeah. spread? Right? There's, there's a lot of implications, right? This is, um, you know, for us are complicated systems. Um, can we better understand them? And then you're also even going as far as actually uh, co uh, f counting trees as well, which I think is very cool. We typically don't even know, and it's hard because you have to, you have to uh, count trees while there's parks and grass and bushes and all this other type of stuff. But you can actually do interesting things like you can tell like up there on some of our satellite imagery is the Ooh. difference between, you know, like Redwood City and Atherton here in the Bay Area. And like yep. there's like a difference in socioeconomic status and there's a difference in tree count. In Africa, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is where um, you know one of the things you do with these pixel level data sets. So a lot of what we do is just this very, very raw data, um, and you start to add some sort of semantic content on it, right? You say this is a house, this is a tree, this is a road. Um, now think about starting to overlay other data sets. Once I've started counted a bunch of objects and I kind of know what's going on on the ground, now what if I look at um, uh, what if I look at 911 calls? What if I look at asthma? What if I look at um, median incomes? Now you start to layer these different things yeah. and um, you start to see correlations. Um, and as you build up on those correlations, eventually you can look for causation. So I, like this, this is work we did uh, counting trees in the city. As you can imagine, um, what you can't just do is look for green things because you're gonna count a lot of things that aren't trees. Um, and it's hard to do this, even if you wanted to send out a fleet of humans to do it, it's hard. There's private property, there's places they can't get to, yeah. they can't go physically count every tree, so you kind of need a, an automatic system like this. Yeah. So um, this was a, a fun project uh, last summer. I like that, Detecting detectors to count the trees as well. Uh, you can also do cool things like see the parts of our living areas that don't have in, as many <laughs> trees. Yeah, I mean, it's neat, like, when you see um, in the middle, you can see Manhattan, right? Yeah. Um, and obviously Central Park pops out. Yeah. But again, I love these... Um, they're like these negative maps, right? Where yes. you're not actually seeing things, you're seeing some phenomenon, but out of that negative image pops out you know, uh, you can see the streets of Manhattan, right? Like, isn't that cool? And how big of a tree desert <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it is beside <laughs> Central Park, pretty much. Um, yeah, and, uh, and then Minneapolis on the left and Miami on the right. Mm -hmm. Okay. You get some really beautiful pictures, too. <laughs> yeah, that one's gorgeous. Baltimore? Baltimore, yeah. Again, you can tell a uh, higher socioeconomic status. Well, also, the higher socioeconomic status, but also higher density, right? As you can imagine, Population there's Population density, yeah, yeah. Yep, there's fewer trees in places where there are lots of buildings. Um, but yeah, it really starts, again, sometimes these data sets are interesting on their own. It's really cool that you can count the trees, um, but it's also interesting when you start combining it with other data sets. Uh, so we've got, um, there's actually some folks in, um, in, in Baltimore who are going to look at this from, uh, from a scientific perspective. So use these, this tree data set and correlate it with some other data sets. So we should have some cool stuff there It's like soon. layering the data sets on top of each other and to get even more profound insights. Um, I want to, I, I love this image. I want to make sure this one, this is kind of like what your, you know, your massive future um, uh, prediction is around the, um, the digital twin and all of the data that we're getting from space, the data that we're getting from the stratosphere, from the air with drones and planes, and then from the ground and subsurface. And like, you can literally have all of that data being refined and have insights that you can pre predict potentially um, and make very uh, high value uh, 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 insights for, for, for people, for organizations, for our planet, for being better stewards. So this is huge and I love this. Well, I think it's neat because um, it's very rare you get a business where you can both make money and do a lot of good. Um, and in our case, we can do both. Like, and in some in some ways, they, they really they really marry each other. So, um, as you help companies who like, no one likes to talk about commodities because they all seem very dirty. Um, but you don't get these higher level products if you don't mine yeah. stuff out of the ground and pump stuff out of the ground. So the question is, how do we make those industries as sustainable as possible? Um, and to me, this is really exciting because we're basically shining a light on these supply chains. Yes. So these supply chains, uh, these commodities have been producing externalities for 
decades, um, but no one can see them. No one can see the methane coming out. No one sees the runoff. But if you start to measure these things, now these companies are going to have to deal with those externalities um, as part of their business. Um, and if I were one of these companies, I would sort of be taking, taking it into my own hands, saying, wow, maybe I should actually measure my effect before governments, NGOs, the UN starts to measure it for me um, and really become a leader in this space. So I think one of the neat things about lighting up supply chains is not just about, hey, I'm going to make more money against my competitor. Um, it's really lighting up uh, exactly what's happening um, from, uh, from a pollution and sustainability perspective. Yes, yes. And yeah, an ethical perspective. Um, yeah, where uh, where we're mining the resources from the ground, uh, because we typically only just go and uh, provide an amount of money for the for the piece of hardware that we're purchasing. But to actually understand what's going into it, a supply chain across the world to light that up is very beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah. You do want to yeah explain? This is what you're actually be able to see from one of the landsats that go every 16 days. Is that? Um, no, I believe this is a satellite called Discover. Um, okay. So, basically, kind of watching. Um, is it one strip? Is that on one strip, or is that on the whole thing? No, no, no. This sort of like this sort of sits at. Um, it's a really neat satellite. It sits at a Lagrange point. So basically. Oh, it's a Lagrange point. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> so. Cool. Um, uh, a new satellite that kind of went up that you can kind of see at global scale. You know, it's weird. Um, the first time that we saw a picture of the planet is this flame, famous blue dot picture that yeah, um, dot. Stuart Brands uh, um, pushed to NASA. Um, and this wasn't that long ago, right? This was in the 60s that the blue dot picture came out. Um, and now we have all these satellites going up, all these satellites who have recorded uh, data for years. Now it's time to go do something with it. Like, it's very inspiring to see that blue dot picture because it puts the world into perspective. Yeah. Uh, but it still doesn't give you any information about what's going on down there. So now is the time. We've got the computing resources to do it. Um, we have the machine intelligence now to go analyze this stuff at, at true scale. Um, so uh, if ever there's a time to go build, well, and I think that there's a, a planetary reason to do so, right? Like we need to understand what we're doing in much, much more detail. So become um, wiser. All those things together mean now is the time. Now is the time. Yeah, yeah. And then it's you see. So then you actually used. Uh, Amazon Web Services and and for all of this crazy amount of data refining of petabytes of data, like in parallel processing like forty thousand cores. Yeah, so yeah. we we did something really cool this week. Um, so there's a top five hundred list of supercomputers uh, that comes out every six months. Um, and what we did was we wanted to prove that we could get on that list in the cloud. So we did. Uh, so we're number 136 in the world, uh, but it's really funky because what, the way we did it was without any help from Amazon, basically like just swiping a credit card. So this is truly just commodity hardware, commodity processing. Um, we were able to get 1.926 petaflops out of this cluster. So it's really neat. If you look at the entry on the top 500 list, um, it says Descartes Labs. But the underlying hardware isn't a Cray computer or an IBM computer or a Dell computer. This is, uh, you know, Amazon East One Ace, like some cluster in an anonymous yeah, place yeah. in the East Coast, um, and that's really neat because I think it means that um, a you can sweep, you don't need to spend twenty plus million dollars on a supercomputer yeah. and go rent it for thousands of dollars if you need to need to spin one up, um, and I think I think we broke the list, right? Like yeah. I think that <laughs> you can imagine. For the next list, there'll be a lot of a lot of teams who say, yes. "Hey, I want to be I want to be on the list too," and I guess I can just do it on Amazon. Uh, so I bet there's going to be a bunch of the next list, and that'll cause them to ask some questions. Democratizing high performance computing is critical to that digital twin simulation conversation we were having for healthcare, for the planetary um, simulations, for all this type of stuff. Yeah, it's. And it used yeah. to be that compute was really the only people that had access to that level of computing resources. Um, were large companies and large governments. And now that we've democratized that, it means that compute is everywhere. I mean, e even the, the phone that you have, 
uh, right, is a pretty powerful computer. Uh, but when we can do things like build a true supercomputer in the cloud, it means that you can run simulation at, at scale. If you think about the early supercomputers, one of the reasons that we built them um, was to simulate things like uh, nuclear weapons, right? So after the test ban treaty in the 60s, we wanted to make sure that these things still work. So there was a lot of simulation work done in early supercomputers. Um, and this is true for things like weather modeling, right, that you want to do at scale. So um, this isn't just an academic exercise of spinning up supercomputers in the cloud, even though it's pretty cool. Um, it really is critical to just bring these resources to a much broader set of people. Yep. And the company Descartes Labs is named after Rene Descartes. Yep. Who actually, you were you know, teaching me about this a little bit earlier, but his, uh, there's so many things here. It's not only the, like, I think, therefore I am, um, but it's also things like connecting arithmetic and geometry, which is crucial for calculus. Um, he has some other really profound things, like refusing to accept authority of previous philosophers, saying things like, I will write on this topic as if no one had written on these matters before. Like, I love that stuff. Uh, the, if if uh, a, a very accessible, beautiful work of philosophy is Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy, his sort of primary work. Um, and he writes it in a very conversational tone, and he asks you to come on the journey with him. It's a thought experiment. So in the early meditations, he starts to think about what he knows. And he goes through this great thought experiment. He looks at wax, and he asks whether the candle is what he knows, and it melts, and is like, is that the same material? So he brings you on this journey uh, with him. Uh, and it's really just a beautiful piece of literature, a beautiful piece of philosophy. There's the man himself. Um, yeah, so just an incredibly important human being. Um, in that, he separates mind and body. Uh, so um, the mind is the thinking thing, um, and it experiences the world. Um, one of the things he was trying to do with the meditations was make science safe in the church. Um, it was one of his primary goals is to separate knowledge from God. Um, so mind and body both proceed from God in the meditations. And the reason he was doing this was to try to uh, make science safe from the church. Uh, so yeah, he was just a towering figure um, and, and one of my great heroes. So it's cool to have a company named after him. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, and similar with like Tesla, Nikola Tesla, right? And it's the same thing, like Descartes Labs, now we have that. I, like, I love it, I love it. We're, yeah. Science safe from the church. From the church, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and again, so Cartesian coordinate system is where a lot of people experience him. So like yeah. X and Y coordinate system. Which is how we mapped our uh, planet with longitude and latitude so that you can be able to say cool things like we are at this specific. <laughs> I, I would love to say that the reason that we chose the name Descartes was all these principled things like the XY <laughs> coordinate system. It also, Descartes means maps in French. Cart means map. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but really it was, um, I was looking at a bunch of URLs one night and realized that uh, a lot of the names that we thought about choosing weren't available. And Descartes Labs was available, um, the URL was available, and the Twitter handle was available. So I called it done. Um, but yeah, it's a great, it's a great name. It's a very respectable yeah, name because anything else that you'd really could potentially come up with would potentially like pigeonhole you into something but Descartes Labs keeps you really like wide open. And yeah. He's a really broad thinker and I think you know we we're inspired yes. by great scientists by great thinkers um, so yes. to have him as our namesake is pretty cool. I have a couple quick questions on the way out. Do you think that we're in a simulation? I mean I, I always think that's a I don't like questions like that where um, I, I like them as thought experiments, but I'm not sure what sort of answer you want there. Um, I mean, you sort of have to define simulation, um, and I think by any reasonable um, definition of simulation that we would agree upon, the answer is probably yes. I don't know what that gains us, right? Because if you can't, um, if you have no epistemic knowledge of who is creating that simulation and how it's being created, I'm not sure that the knowledge of being in a simulation is very useful or applicable. Which we may gain that knowledge, potentially. Now that's interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. It's all about epistemic access. So um, like, do you have the ability to go, um, to go answer this question? Is, is it a question that you can pose um, and get a reasonable scientific answer, yes or no? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I actually do think we'd probably live in a simulation. I think, again, it's, it's simulations all the way up and all the way down. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're going to have to deal with this soon because we're going to start simulating, simulating things. Simulating things, especially civilizations, universes, all this type of stuff. And then the genie's out of the bottle and then, <laughs> and then we better understand ourselves and we're able to tweak variables and play with um, which is kind of what we're potentially already in so I mean yeah the matrix is one of the most important like philosoph like if you think about totally. when I started studying philosophy it was also right around the release of the matrix which is just this like mind-blowing movie when you first see it yes yes and um it really makes you wonder where does that simulation end and let's ask the very last question what is the most beautiful thing in the world oh the sangre de cristo mountains right by santa fe new mexico yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i haven't been but you've I've, been there five years now five years and i tell you i have, I have a deep personal relationship with those mountains that's beautiful um, yeah. i it's not just, uh, there's raw beauty in a lot of different places, um, but for me, beauty is also about connection. Um, and I've hiked those mountains a lot of times. Um, I've just spent a lot of time thinking and being up there, um, and they're just wonder, I'm sounding like a total hippie right now, um, but they're wonderfully welcoming. Yes. Uh, and I miss them when I'm, I'm not close, and I think yes. they miss me a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so you should it. come out to Santa Fe sometime, and I can, we would um, love I can that. take you up to my friend, the Sangre de Cristos. We it means blood that, of Christ, yeah. uh, because yeah. as the sun sets, uh, especially during the summer, uh, they get this beautiful red purple hue ah. over the mountains. Oh, cool, cool. That's where it comes from, Sangre de Cristo. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Yes, please. And it's also potentially a, a another beautiful thing to um, have people go and how many people even know the Rockies extend themselves down to Santa Fe in New Mexico? Like I sure cool. didn't. Yeah, I sure do. I sure do. I don't. I need to go and uh, yeah, and, and enjoy that um, and connect with it spiritually. Descartes Labs is doing incredible work. Mark, you have been a major role model for us in the space where like, you're, you're really thinking on some visionary stuff here with stacking all of these different optical radar, all these different layers of, of understanding uh, deforestation, understanding tree counts, all this kind of crazy stuff, digital twins, data refineries. I mean, you're like, we're really excited. We'll have to do um, an update from you. Yeah. We'd, we'd love to hear the update from you soon. So keep us in mind when you come back through the area. Um, there's still a lot to understand about what you guys are doing. So keep up the good work. We're all counting on you. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. I'm glad you've had a good time, Mark. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, check out the links. Check out all those links, DescartesLabs.com, Twitter on Descartes Labs, as well as the Medium, and also uh, Mark's uh, Twitter, Philosophy Geek. Check those out, everyone. And also, uh, have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about the importance of digital twins, about satellite imagery, about the future with sensing technologies and analyzing all the data and refining it. Also, shout out to Ron Vogus, our producer and director. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation. Our links are below our Patreon, our cryptocurrency link, our PayPal link. Support us. Help us grow as well. And go and build the future, everyone. If you want to, you can make cool, thought-provoking merch. I'm not wearing one of the shirts right now, but that link is below, too. You can design merch and get paid for it. Check out that link. Build the future, everyone. Manifest those dreams into the world. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace.